Hello, I'm Lisa Carrico, Director of Family and Veteran Programs for the Missouri Humanities. We are a member-supported organization. Our mission is to connect Missourians to the people, places, and ideas that shape society. Thank you for joining this 10-part virtual storytelling journey that brings the book, Growing Up with the River, Nine Generations on the Missouri to Life. Growing Up with River by Dan and Connie Burkhart explores our state's rich cultural heritage through the eyes of nine generations of children growing up in river towns along the Missouri River. Each of the 10 chapters will be presented by a professional storyteller and special guest or guest. The series will run every Wednesday at 4 p.m. on Facebook Live, ending on September 30th. I'm excited to introduce today's chapter La Charette, 1806, near present-day Marthasville. La Charette was the westernmost trading settlement on the Missouri River at the turn of the century. Lewis and Clark stopped here in 1804 and again in 1806. This was the frontier, full of wild game and home to Native Americans. Indigenous people have inhabited Missouri since time immemorial. Today, there are over 80,000 Native Americans living in the state. To honor this history, I will start with a land acknowledgement. Land acknowledgements honor a place's indigenous people and recognize the history that brought us to where we are today. The Missouri Humanities would like to acknowledge that this program is being held on the ancestral territory of the Osage, the Illini, the Iowa, the Missouri, Oto, Quapaw, Kansai, Sioux, Sac and Fox. We thank them for their hospitality and stewardship on this land. Today's chapter will be presented by Robert Lewis, award-winning native storyteller, author, artist of Cherokee, Navajo, and Apache, Apache descent. Robert's been telling stories for 20 years in various schools and communities in Oklahoma and across the nation including the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., and the Museum of American Indian in New York. Robert started telling at the Cherokee Heritage Center in Oklahoma and has, been, has since been honored as a Cherokee national treasure for his storytelling. After Robert's reading, we'll in, introduce our special guest, who will explore several themes mentioned in this chapter. We send our deepest gratitude to the Burkharts for writing such an incredible book and for entrusting us to share the incredible stories within and to artist Brian Haynes for allowing us to share his beautiful book images. Please let us know that you're watching by asking questions and leaving comments in our Facebook comment thread. Without further ado, and in partnership with the Higher Education Channel, HECTV, St. Louis Storytelling Festival, Missouri History Museum, and Magnificent Missouri, we present Growing Up with the River. Chapter 1, 1806, La Charette. Near present day Marthasville was the westernmost trading settlement on the Missouri River, the turn of the 19th century. <clears throat> Lewis and Clark stopped here going up river in 1804 and again triumphant on the return to St. Louis on September 20th, 1806. This was the frontier full of Native Americans and wild game. The boy liked this time of year. The bugs and heat of summer were gone and acorns began to fall from the trees and cover the ground. He sometimes collected them in small piles and saved the biggest ones. He was serious about his foraging for the best and biggest acorns. But his sister was only five, and still she made a game of it. She tried to catch them as they fell, scampering from one oak tree to another. He placed a hand on each shoulder and stared straight at her. Are you a girl or a red-tailed squirrel? You fell out of a nest of red-tailed squirrels and you're looking for your supper. Acorns. No, I'm your real sister. I don't eat acorns. The boy regarded his barefoot sister in, his rag in her ragged dress and said, no, no, ma'am, you are plainly a squirrel in girl's clothing. He also liked to tease her about things he could remember, but she was too little to recall. He asked her about the biggest boat imaginable that had stopped by their village two years ago. How many men were in it? 
What color was their dog? He knew she didn't even remember that they had a dog. But their visit two years ago in May was as clear to him as the leaves that were starting to turn autumn yellow in front of his eyes. This time of year was better than the spring because it was so wet early in the year. In the spring, the river was high and hard to paddle as it was tangled with limbs and branches and whole trees bumping down the river. Now and again, a drowned buffalo and whole floated by their encampment. Some villagers said they had seen live buffalo near their camp, but he had never seen one, so he knew these animals had come from far away. In the spring, the river sometimes came into their small village, causing them to move with their pigs and cows to higher ground. This time of year, when the acorns fell, was better. His parents told him they had been here for three winters, coming from a place on the east on the river called St. Charles. He remembered the trip here because they had come in autumn when the river was low. The boy's family packed their tools and cooking supplies and traveled upriver to the wide river bottoms. West of their settlement, there were no Frenchmen, Spaniards, or Americans of European descent. In this small camp, they joined other French families and proceeded to clear some ground and build small log shelters. Hunting was good here, and the men killed large numbers of deer and bear. His father said they would move upriver when the deer and bear were killed and find another place to hunt. But for now, hunting was good. From time to time, Osage, Fox, and Sock came to La Charette, as they called her small cluster of houses and sheds. With their arms full of beaver pelts and skins, the Indians traded with people in the village, furs and pelts for trinkets. And other goods came from the east. Sometimes an Osage child came to the village and joined in games with the boy and his sister. One Shawnee, Indian Phillips, often came to the village and delighted in scaring the children. All of the children were afraid of him because he scowled at them and told frightening stories. An expert hunter and tracker, he even knew the great explorer Daniel Boone, who lived in the hills to the east, was said to have hunted with him. At this time of year, the boy and his sister began to gather firewood from the river's edge. Soon the cooking fires would blaze day and night for warmth keeping the wolves farther away from the camp. Five days ago, a party of white men came down the river in a white peru and several canoes as they approached La Charette. The river men asked and raised their guns, cheered and fired three round salute to announce their arrival. The trading boats were then moored at the boys riverbank and answered with three rounds. He heard his mother and father talking with excitement about the arrival of the visitors. These were the same travelers who had passed the village two years earlier on their way upriver. Is it really them, Mama? We, oui, it's a miracle, but it's them. One of their party spoke to his parents in their language, French. Since the voyagers had not been seen in two years, everyone thought that they were dead. The visitors were most definitely alive, but they had no provisions and no goods to trade. Their hunger was strong and they had been surviving on only wild plums and pawpaws along the river's edge for recent days. The leader of the group was named Lewis, and he came into the village with his dog, the blackest and biggest dog they had ever seen, more like a small bear. Many times since he was little, <clears throat> the boy thought he had dreamed the boat that was big enough to carry a crew in an enormous dog up river. It was no dream. They had returned. His sister ran off to find some scraps of food for the bear dog, Seaman. But the boy walked alongside Lewis and his group, wishing that the dog could share his own adventures on the Missouri. With the many visitors, the boy and his sister knew they would never forget this date, September 20th, 1806. That night, there was un grand fête, a big celebration in the village. The woodlands near La Charette were prime hunting grounds, and the guests were delighted to see roast of deer and turkey. Since it was just past summer's end, the garden still had their bounty to share, and plates of corn, beans, and squash made their way to the table. Loaves of persimmon bread baked on a low fire. The boy heard the visitors talk about the water, an ocean they had seen at the end of their village and voyage. It was so wide that they could not see their land on the other side. Fish in the ocean were as big as their boats. The boy thought that one day he might like to see the far water the ocean the explorers had seen. He listened to the stories about the herds of thousands of buffalo, herds so vast that it took hours for them to pass by the explorer's camp. 
The boy wondered if they had seen the same buffalo so tall. The buffalo he saw floating in the river that spring. The adventurers told of hills so tall that they were still covered with snow in the summer. They had seen enormous bears as big as bulls, and they had traded with many different Indian tribes. But mostly tonight, the men wanted to eat. They had been paddling for hard for days so that they could return to St. Louis, where they had begun their journey. More than 850 days into their journey, they were ready to get home. In their rush to return, the men hadn't stopped to hunt in days. Lewis and his men thanked the villagers many times for the feast in their honor. The boy also heard the visitors talk with his parents about La Chevette being part of the United States now. The explorers were on their big adventure because America was growing. The boy had heard his father and the other villagers talking about the changes they thought would be coming from the Louisiana Purchase. But on this night, it seemed like those concerns were forgotten. After the visitors left the next morning, his father said that it was exciting to have such a party to hear stories of land and waters far away. But his father warned, there will come a day when there will be problems from this trip, when others will want this land for themselves. He said that the explorations of these men could change the way the boy lived, and those who lived in his village and other places on the river. Still, the boy decided that the visit by Lewis, his dog, Clark, and his crew was magical. In the spring, he would plant the largest acorn he could find on the hillside overlooking the village, where he had first seen the men in the boats arrive. When I read this part of the story, uh, I'm reminded of the fact that uh, I'm Cherokee, Navajo, and Apache. And uh, <clears throat> as a tribal people, we're very well connected with the land and take care of each other. And our families are extremely important to each other. And so when we talk about aspects of storytelling, because I've been a storyteller for a number of years, um, I would hear stories told to me by my father, who's Navajo and Apache. My mom would tell me some stories and some of my uncles, the Cherokee. And I would hear these stories and as a small child, you love little stories and you're sitting there and you're listening to them. But these weren't stories from books. These are stories that they were telling them, an oral history. And so when they would tell these stories, I would sit there and I would listen to them and never realized that one day I'd end up becoming a storyteller because I've got my training as an artist and painter. But one day when I was working at a Cherokee Heritage Center, I was sitting there and a group of children were sitting there and they were kind of bored and restless. And I knew a couple of my dad's stories. So I told a couple. Well, somebody saw me and they said, I didn't know you're a storyteller. And I said, I know a few. And next thing I know, the museum started offering uh, storytelling to various guests who came to the museum. And the next thing I know, when I was working at the Heritage Center in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, I was sit there and I began to tell all these different stories and they concerned about bears and wolves and deers and panthers, but also about the origins of the skies and stars. And I began to gathering more and more and more stories. It's extremely rich history. And uh, every tribe has them. Um, I've gone to every schools and communities and talked to other children there. I told them, uh, you can enjoy these stories. They're passed down for you to sit there and listen, and hopefully for you to pass them down as well. Um, the bear story itself uh, reminds me of the fact that uh, when the little boy talked about seeing the bear and the squirrels out there, there was his sister running around as a squirrel. Uh, one time there was a group of uh, stickball players, and stickball was a game, uh, they call it lacrosse. It's a French word for lacrosse, uh, because when the tribes were running around out there playing sticks with their ball sticks, uh, the Frenchmen saw them and asked them what they were doing. They said it was part of the religious ceremony, and the only religion they were was with, familiar with was Catholicism, so Catholics would bring it cross down the center of the aisle, so they call it the cross. So they're running around. And in this story, they can't find the ball. And when they can't find the ball, they go to the medicine man. The medicine man coaxes this small little tree out, or the smallest little squirrel out of this tree. The little squirrel comes bouncing on down. The medicine man talks to the little squirrel, needs it to be a ball. And sits there and blows some smoke on it. And the little squirrel rolls up into a ball. And they take that ball and they run out in the ball field and they're sitting there playing with it, tossing back and forth. And when they finish the game, they bring it back to the medicine man. The medicine takes it. Talks some more back to the little ball, blows smoke back in it, and the little squirrel pops up, and this little squirrel go bouncing on up into the tree. So when I was sat there and I hear various stories like that, and I remind children when they would come to the museum, they would sit there, where did that come from? The ball sticks, they came from something. We have a story about a rabbit that caused tr uh, trickery amongst all the tribes. 
and uh, he needed more food, and he worked out a way to bake some ball sticks so he could steal his ball and play this game and get the men to have their wives give him some more food. But when the men figured it out, they made their own sticks, and so they chased that rabbit around, and they got their ball stick back, and they got on the ball field, and the rabbit threw his sticks down and said, I don't want to play this anymore, and walked off. But that's where we got our ball sticks. So everything we got, we got from one of our tricksters or we're from one of our animals. And uh, Rabbit also has a bear story involving a blowgun or river cane. But for the most part, when you're sitting there and you're hearing all these stories and I involve children when I do storytelling, I'll pull them up and they get to be the bear, or the wolf, or the deer, or the panther. And when they become this animal, I'm sitting there talking about them, explaining what they're doing with the story. I can see revelations being opened up in their eyes. And so it's a wonderful thing. And so this book is also an aspect of that because when the children read it, they're seeing these images. And when they see these images coming up for them, for them from somebody else, uh, it empowers them to learn more about their own history. Thank you so much, Robert, for uh, presenting this reading on chapter one and also um, sharing a part of your history and your stories and, and how important it is for uh, generations to hear stories passed along and the things that we learn from that. So thank you so much. Um, I am excited to introduce uh, our special guest for today, Emily Kelso, a K through 12 museum educator at the Missouri Historical Society where she works with students from all over the St. Louis region to understand multiple perspectives and find themselves in history. Our second guest today that I'll follow Emily is Aaron Whitson, our uh, his historical archeologist for the Missouri Humanities. And together they will explore one of Lewis and Clark's journals and we'll talk about piecing together the native history of Missouri through the field of archeology. span All right, uh, thank you so much, Lisa, for that introduction and for the opportunity to be here with you all today. I'm very excited to present uh, the Lewis and Clark story, uh, even in a very quick way with you all. And we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the history of Lewis and Clark, what they were doing on this expedition, what they were trying to accomplish. But one of the things we also talk about at the Missouri Historical Society is how we know uh, so much of this history. Um, and we're gonna get into a little bit of um, why it's so important to document what it is that you're seeing and you're experiencing so that we can know so much about this history. But let's learn a, a little bit more about what Lewis and Clark were actually doing. So we're gonna start by looking at a map of the United States. Um, this is a map that shows what the United States looked like around the year 1803. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is the president. Uh, that might be a name you're familiar with if you're watching along. Uh, the yellow line that goes down through the middle of the map is the Mississippi River. And everything to the east of the Mississippi River or going toward the, the right-hand side of your screen, that's the United States uh, at this time. Thomas Jefferson, as the president, decides that he is going to purchase the land west of the Mississippi River and add it to the United States. This is what we call the Louisiana Purchase, and that is actually referenced in the story that Robert read for us. Um, however, uh, there was one problem with this that Thomas Jefferson had, which was he'd never been to this area of the, the country of the land. He didn't know what was out there. So he needed some help to be able to explain for him what it was that he had just purchased for the United States. And to do that, he turned to two men. He turned to Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. Meriwether Lewis is on the right-hand side of your screen, the gentleman with the grayish hair. He was a secretary and a writer, but he was also a frontiersman and a, a member of the army. Um, and he had a lot of experience with traveling. And he reached out to William Clark uh, and said, can you help me uh, take this expedition on because I have some things I need to do. So together they decided to lead uh, an expedition, which is a big group of people who are gonna take a journey and they were gonna travel through this new Louisiana territory and do some exploring. Now, if you're following along, I want you to hold up three fingers because uh, there were three goals that they had uh, from Thomas Jefferson that they needed to do. Well, they had a lot of goals, but we're gonna boil it down to three. Um, so count them off with me. And actually, uh, if we could show the letter that Jefferson sent, this is a copy of a letter that Jefferson sent. Uh, in this letter, he said, you've got three main objectives while you travel. Number one, I need you to make some maps 
from me. I need to know what this new land of Louisiana territory looks like um, because he was trying to find a route for trading. So I need to know what's out there. The second goal, you're holding up two fingers now, the second goal, he said, is I want you to go meet the people that live there. While there weren't European settlers in the western part of the United States, there were lots of Native American tribes and people that had lived here for thousands of years. So he actually sent Lewis and Clark out with a list of questions to ask them. He wanted to know a lot of information about the people that were living there. And the third goal, and this is the one we're gonna spend the most time talking about today, is he wanted them to document the flora and the fauna. So in the same way he needed to know what kind of geographical features were out there, he needed to know what kind of plants and animals were out there too. And that's what we're gonna spend the most time uh, looking at today. Um, so the main way that Lewis and Clark kept track of everything that they were seeing and observing was by keeping journals. Um, and we at the Missouri Historical Society actually have uh, their journals in our collection. Um, and this is what one of the journals looked like. If you can see on the side, there's a little um, ruler so that you can see this journal is actually not very big. It's only about 13 centimeters, maybe five and a half inches wide, maybe about 10 centimeters long. It's not, or excuse me, 10 inches long. It's not very big. Um, and that was to make it easier and more portable. But this is what the journals look like. And this is how we know so much about Lewis and Clark and what their travels were like. Um, so we are actually going to take a look at some of the pages from Lewis and Clark's journals. And we're going to see if it was easy or not to really record their observations, specifically around the plants and the animals that they saw. So if you are following along with us, I want you to grab um, a pencil and a piece of paper if you have one handy, something that you can draw or write with. Because the next slide I'm going to show you is an excerpt from Lewis's diary that he was keeping. So the most one of the important goals they had was to document everything that they were observing. So on the day of February 25th, 1806, Meriwether Lewis recorded this journal entry about an animal that he saw. And I want you, based on this description, to see if you can draw the animal that he is describing. The top part that has the italics, that's the part that's actually written in Meriwether Lewis's language. So it's a little more complicated, a little more flowery than the way we talk today. So down at the bottom, we've made some bullet points for you. So if you have a pencil and paper handy, I want you to draw what you think an animal looks like that is small, that has a tail as long as its body and neck. I want you to draw an animal that this animal has black eyes, a few long black whiskers. It's a reddish dark brown color. Its neck and belly are a pale brick red, so it's kind of got some different colors on its body. Its tail is a mixture of black and dark reddish brown. The hair on its body is half an inch long and very soft, but the hair on its tail is one inch long and not as soft. So again, take about 20 seconds, look through that description and just sketch out what animal could this be? based on Meriwether Lewis's description. So just take about 20 seconds and sketch that out. And if you think you know what the animal is, I want you to drop it in the comments. If you think you have a guess as to what animal Meriwether Lewis is describing here, I want you to put it in the comments. And if you are a student following along with us today, you can type it yourself or you can get an adult or a parent to type it for you if that's uh, an easier way to do that. If you think you know what the animal is, let us know. Let's take about 10, 15 more seconds to get our thoughts. It's an animal that's small, has a tail as long as its body and neck. Black eyes, few long black whiskers. I saw someone guessed weasel, possibly a squirrel. Yeah, these descriptions could fit a couple of different animals. That's why this is a difficult task that Meriwether Lewis and William Clark have been assigned. A mink, I saw someone else vote for squirrel, but we're all putting question marks 
we're not quite sure. We think we know what it might be, but we're not quite sure. And that is because it's really hard to describe something to someone that can't see it. Lewis and Clark are traveling at a time where they don't have access to cameras. And so it's really important that they are as descriptive as possible about all of these plants and animals. All right, so if you have your drawing, okay, you have it in front of you. I'm gonna show you a picture now of what Meriwether Lewis was looking at. This is the animal that Meriwether Lewis was looking at. This is the brown squirrel. And I actually took out the words where he described it, uh, where he named it, because he compared it to other animals from back home. But it just shows that it was really important for them to be as specific as possible in both their writing and their drawing when they were recording these observations. Because if he had described this animal and then included no images or no other descriptive words, the people back home, Thomas Jefferson, would not have known what any of these animals were. It could be a mink, it could be, I saw someone guessed a sloth, any of those could fit that description. So in the same way that you practiced your drawing skills, just like Lewis and Clark did, I'm gonna show you a couple of pages from their journals and I'm going to have you in the comments put some descriptive words for what these images would be. So this is the first one. Don't worry about looking at the words, just look at the drawing that they did. How would you describe this drawing if you had to describe it to someone? You can put those in the comments, please. How would you describe this drawing? Hmm, what words could you use for that? You can put any thoughts you have in the comments and we'll see that. How would you describe this plant? Take about 15 more seconds to think it through. Serrated green leaves stacked in pairs. Excellent, so describing how it's connected to the branch and the word serrated describes it as uh, spiky, prickly, having points, sharp points, part of a fern, okay? Okay, could be part of a fern or it could be a good way to compare it to something that people back east would know, right? If people back east had seen a fern, you could say this was a part of a type of fern or it looked like a fern, something very similar to that, okay? Any other thoughts that anyone has on how you would describe this? Zigzag or teeth-like edges. Yeah, yeah, comparing it to things that we can imagine is gonna be really, really helpful when we're trying to describe things back home so that they know what it is that we're looking at out on this journey if we're imagining like we're Lewis and Clark. Great, let's try this with another one. This is a little bit harder. So this image is a little hard to see, and that's because, again, these pages are very, very old. So when we try and make them digital, it's difficult to see. But if you can, really try and focus in on that image that's on that page, and give me some words you would use to describe this image. How would you describe what you saw here? This one might be a little bit harder, a little bit trickier, and you can put those in the comments. Yeah, we're still getting some uh, descriptions of the leaf that was previous, a thin stem. I like pointing out that it has a thin stem with smaller leaves. Very good, very, very um, precise. Of this image from one of Clark's journals, what would you, how would you describe this image? What words would you use to describe it? It's a tricky one. Take about 10 more seconds and think it through. Type in your responses in the comments. Or if you have a guess as to what animal this is. It's not immediately apparent, I think. I think we're really stuck on this one. This one's pretty hard. We're not sure really what this animal is or even how to describe it. Yeah, it's a large bird. It has a beak, a curved beak. It'd be multicolored. Yeah, ideally we would add some color to it. 
Um, the curved beak that falls over the bottom part, much like an overhanging tooth, very descriptive. I can really see that image in my mind. Um, rounded head, curved beak hangs over its mouth. Excellent descriptions of that. This is actually uh, their best attempt at drawing a vulture. Um, and we can interpret whether or not it was uh, a good, good version of that or not. But I think it also speaks to how difficult it was for them to really capture everything that they were observing. Um, Lewis was widely known as being the better writer because he was a secretary. Clark, he could write and, and did, kept lots of observations and journals, but he also preferred to draw because he found it harder to write. He just had a more difficult time with that. Um, so they all, they both did their best to write and draw as much as they could see in terms of the plants and the animals and the land and the people. Um, but we see that it's pretty difficult to actually record those observations and make them accurate for the people that are watching back home or that we're gonna absorb that information back home. So we're actually gonna challenge you to try to record your observations. We have a little bit of a takeaway challenge for you. Um, this is a handout that you can print off and the Humanities Council will also provide this for you as well. Um, the next time you are on a walk, the next time you go to a park, the next time if you're lucky enough to go to the river, um, do some observations of different plants or animals that you see and try and pretend like you are Lewis and Clark, like you're exploring this and you need to document it to take it back and tell people what you see. And use this page to draw what you see as best you can and then put some descriptive words down below it. You can write those in sentences or just bullet points if that's easier for you. I know it says draw a plant or animal that Lewis and Clark encountered on their journey. Don't worry about that. You can just choose any plant or animal that you want and you don't have to worry about using Lewis's description about a plant or animal. You can just describe it in whatever way you want to do. So um, I hope that this was a good kind of quick history on what Lewis and Clark were doing and gave us an appreciation for the difficulties that they experienced in trying to document this. Um, but we are very lucky at the Missouri Historical Society to have so many of their original documents and artifacts uh, in our collection. And we encourage you to come visit us uh, using our reservation system to learn more about them. And to learn more about artifacts and how we come by them, I'm gonna toss it over now to Erin. Hi, um, I'm Erin. I'm Missouri Humanities Archeologist. Um, so Emily was did a very good job of, of telling you how we know more about Lewis and Clark and their journey west. But we know that the people lived here on the continent of North America for a very long time before Lewis and Clark came through. So how do you think we learn, historians or archaeologists, learn more about those people who lived here with and, and who didn't write things down? Any ideas? Archaeology. Um, so archaeology, for those who might not know, is the study of people in the past. We will sometimes dig through the ground to see if we can find little things that people left behind. Um, not always in the ground. Sometimes we, we find other things that people left behind. If you'll turn to the first picture. Um, Sometimes we find rock art and rock art tells us a lot sometimes about some of the, the ways people might be thinking about the world. This is from Missouri. This is from um, Washington State Park in Missouri. Um, it gives us hints about where people might be going with the way they look at the world. Um, you can see a snake there and there are those little grooves there that might be peck marks where people were um, grinding stones into, but they might also represent some other things, other creatures, other th things out in the world that we today, from our perspective, we might not necessarily understand. Um, that's the tricky part of archaeology, sort of like tricky part of trying to understand um, what animals Lewis and Clark may have been thinking about through the journals and their descriptions. Um, the only thing we as archaeologists have to, to know about the world in the past are those little bits that survive over time. And, you know, those sorts of things are rock. You might get lucky and find bone if you're in the right soils that don't, you know, they're not acidic and won't eat it. Um, or you might find things like pottery. But a lot of the things that they would have been having or wearing 
aren't necessarily still around. So we have to sometimes guess and we have to peek at artifacts and try to you know, tease out some of those clues. Um, if you turn to the next image, um, here's one of those sorts of artifacts that we have picked up when we were doing work. This is sort of what we think about as, a, it's sort of like a multi-tool. It's been used in a lot of different ways by someone a long time ago. We, we've got areas where they were using it to cut with, like a knife, areas where they were using it to scrape furs, um, and areas where they were probably using it to straighten like an arrow shaft to make it straight. Um, so lots of really creative ways of just using a piece off of a rock that just popped off. Um, it works, you know, it works smart, not hard, right? And that's in this case, this is what they were doing. So um, that tells us that they're doing a lot of different sorts of things at, at a particular site. They're processing things and creating new things as they, they live in a space. Um, if you go to the next one, that is something probably more of you are familiar with. That's a it's projectile point. Um, it's not necessarily an arrowhead. It's kind of big maybe for an arrowhead, but it could be a spear point or an atlatl dart point um, or just a knife, a hafted knife that they were using. Um, but it's a beautiful little, little guy. If you look at it, it's got kind of a, towards the tip, it's not like a straight line on the edge. It looks like they, they like this guy so much that they kept re-sharpening it over and over for a while. Um, so, you know, we do see them, you know, sometimes getting creative with the tools that they have. Sometimes these things break, you know, and so sometimes we see artifacts that are recycled into new things. Um, and that tells us a little bit about, you know, okay, so we know that they're hunting, but how else are they using these spaces? And sometimes we find, you know, artifacts like that that have broken and they'll use them as scrapers or something along those lines. So sometimes you see some really creative use of, of space and objects by people a long time ago. Um, Native people were as creative as we are today and, you know, way, way back in the day. So, uh, you know, we can't expect them not to, to be as clever with the things that they're using. Um, the next image, that is one of my favorite things that we found. Um, it's kind of a weird little guy. Um, any guesses on what it might be? Anyone? So that's a little face. I'm not sure if you can see it. We're not real sure. So because we don't know what kind of creature it, it might have once represented, um, we just call it a, an unidentified effigy figure. Um, but it probably sat on the edge of a little bowl at one point. Um, so probably not exactly like this guy. This is a different guy, but it may have had a little head on it, some, you know, on the edge of a bowl for people to see when they were using it to cook with or something. So um, that that gives us some hints about, you know, it's, it's art again. So it, it gives us ideas about maybe some of the, <clears throat> sorry, the things that they're interested in replicating, um, which creatures may have certain special connections to whoever was making this or using this. Um, we don't find things like that very often, but when we do, we get excited. So um, it, it does give us a little bit more information about maybe the the religious things they're they're you know walking through the world with, or the ways they're they're imagining the world and how it's put together, um, which gives us ideas about how you know we get to where we are today and how Native peoples may still engage with some of these things today. Um, if you go to the next slide. That is our, the last artifact I'm gonna share with you. Um, that is a piece of pottery. Um, you can see that, so they, to make this, they, um, or to decorate it, they put uh, cords around a paddle and then they pressed it in one direction and then they pressed it in another direction. Um, they're probably using this, this sort of container for, you know, stews or, drinks or things like that. It's a it's a little bowl or a cup. But they're they're decorating it, which, you know, like us, they like 
pretty things in their world. They like things that um, are more than just, you know, this is going to get me through my day. They like things that are beautiful. And we, we see things like this and we can sometimes you step back and you're like, wow, that's another human being, you know, who made this and handled this 12,000 years ago. Um, and they're, you know, special ways of knowing the world that way, which is kind of cool. So we use these things all together, these sorts of things. Um, and we, we also will sometimes use for the more recent sites, we'll use those journals, we'll use documents to tell us more about the world in the past, but sometimes you don't have those things. So the next thing that we also use, especially with native sites is we like to, um, we like to talk to the descendants of those people who made those things. And, you know, the native peoples are still around today and they, you know, they're interested in their histories, they're interested in their pasts. And we like to, to talk to them about those pasts because they may have explanations that we don't think about automatically just off the top of our head for some of the things we find or some of the images and the rock art that we find um, without talking to them and knowing you know, their stories, it's hard for us to, to get a good understanding about where people may have been or how people may have been shaping the world in the past. So um, they're still around. We can't discredit them and their beliefs because they were special in the past. That's the way the, the world was shaped then and it continues to shape us today. So yeah, so archeology span is a little, complicated at times, but we use a lot of the same tricks and tips that Emily was talking about when she was explaining journals to you and, and describing the world around you. Archaeology is a lot like that, only you're finding those clues and then trying to figure out what those clues tell you about the past. And that's what we do. So that's how we know about how Native people and how Europeans, when they were meeting these native people, if they weren't writing things down, we can take the things that we find and we can sort of create the story and try to figure out if we've got enough clues that, that tell us, give us more information than we had before. So um, Lisa's going to take it away with questions and answers and things like that. So yeah. thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. Um, I just want to thank everyone that tuned into our first Growing Up with the River. Thank you, HEC TV, for helping us present this program. Special thanks to our storyteller, Robert Lewis, and guest speakers, Emily and Aaron, for providing us with a fun interpretation on La Charette. After the event, uh, we will be sharing the Missouri Historical Society's Lewis and Clark journaling worksheet like Lewis and Clark and our historical archaeologist, Aaron, we hope that you'll get out into nature um, or in your backyard to make observations and to write and draw about them in your very own journal. Feel free to share your journal entries with us here in the comment thread in Facebook. Thanks to everyone who registered in advance for this series. Today, we will randomly choose a name from the registration list to send a complimentary cop copy of Growing Up With The River. If you'd like to receive series updates that include links to videos, fun book activities, uh, and raffle prizes, visit mohumanities.org. And we hope to see you back next week, same time, same channel, for Chapter 2, Femme Osage. Thank you.